Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the July 27th meeting of the Planning Policy Commission to order. It is currently 6.31 p.m. Tonight's meeting is a hybrid meeting. The Planning Policy Commission is in person, but staff or members of the public may be attending virtually or in person. Thomas, do we have a quorum tonight? Uh, Chair Voice, we have a quorum. We may uh, proceed. Moving on to the second item on our agenda, public comment. There's currently nobody in the room other than staff and our commissioners. Is there anyone who signed up virtually? No one has signed up virtually at this time. Okay. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge we have received comments from a uh, few interested parties. Some of them came in late. I'm hoping everybody had a chance to at least uh, receive them, if not read them quite yet. And also, Commissioner Milligan has sent in some comments as well. We will move on to regular business. And tonight, our next item is the housing element overview for the comprehensive plan. Stephen Padua, our long-range planning manager, will be presenting on this item tonight. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Voice. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Stephen Padua, long-range planning manager with CPD. Um, tonight, we are taking an initial look at the draft goals and policies for the housing element. The direction ne needed for tonight is, uh, do the draft goals and policies accurately reflect the state and county policies, part of your uh, attachments for tonight's materials? Are there ISQA-specific issues that need to be addressed? And is there additional information that would be helpful in evaluating the proposed draft goals and policies? So as I'm going through tonight's presentation, I'll be asking some of these questions as we go through each of the slides. Uh, we can also wait until the very end. It's kind of up to you, Chair Boy, so how best to address the questions. So just as a reminder, with the comprehensive plan, it, the intent of the comprehensive plan is, is really to be the um, placeholder for our goals and policies for the city that, that provide guidance on the city's vision for various topics with the comprehensive plan. And where we have impl implementation of those goals and policies actually contained in the development standards, our land use code, Title 18, uh, the architectural standards, as well as our affordable housing uh, strategy work plan. So those contain a lot of more of the actions and strategies around how we are implementing and achieving the vision. The goals and policies are at a much higher level of giving guidance of much of that implementation. The other portion, uh, that commissioners asked us to kind of address with the comprehensive plan is monitoring. So we do provide a state mandated report card every five years, or will be providing this report card, as well as we provide our annual housing report card that provides updated information and data on housing within the city. The other thing to consider with our housing element is from the King County planning policies, we now have affordable housing targets. And this is a little different from what's required. We are required to have these targets within the city of Issaquah. We are not necessarily having to require specific properties to have these AMI percentages with the new development. It's more about incorporating policies, similar to what we'll discuss tonight, that address how best to achieve these targets. Are there any questions about this? I have a quick question. So are these actual these percentages of AMI, are those set by the city? These were set at the county, but in coordination with a lot of the cities, each city was given uh, their own set of targets. Commissioner Espinueta. And then how often is the AMI um, updated? So this is actually new for okay. all of our cities. Yeah. Um, so. Some of the discussion is figuring out how best to achieve the targets, but the updates is something that will probably be achieved with each of the comprehensive plan periodic updates. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. 
The other thing to consider with our goals and policies is we had to take a look at new legislation, uh, specific to housing. There's the House Bill 1220, uh, House Bill 1110, and House Bill 1337. I'll talk about these as I'm going through the goals and policy updates for tonight. What is required from House Bill 1220 is the accommodation uh, and planning for moderate, low, very low, and extremely low income households. Accommodation and planning for emergency housing, emergency shelters, and permanent supportive housing. Adopting anti-displacement policies as well as providing inventory and monitoring of housing. For House Bill 1110 and 1337, uh, previously back in March, the Commission was updated on these House bills with information that was not quite adopted yet by the legislation. Uh, what is now required uh, for jurisdictions is what's on the screen now. We are still working through a lot of what the bill is requiring from us and working through strategies on how best to do it, but you can expect some of the draft policies to address some of the compliance for these bills. But we'll have further conversations with code updates for full compliance with these bills. But we are still working through a review of these as we haven't received final recommendations or um, guide guidance from the Depart Department of Commerce. For tonight's discussion is organized in the structure that we'll first be going through the new policies being recommended for the housing element. And one thing to note is the housing element is now structured within these different uh, sections based on the goals that we've now are establishing for the housing element. The, for the new proposals, we don't have anything new for the special needs section or the regional resources section but we do have amendments for all the sections, just so you know uh, why some of that's not being addressed up front. So getting started, for housing supply, we have a goal, achieve a variety of neighborhoods, housing types and densities throughout the city. Oh, I need to go back actually. So in your packet, you have uh, housing supply and neighborhood character as different sections. We uh, am omitted having the neighborhood character goal as in your materials. That'll be part of uh, your, your materials for the next meeting, and we'll discuss that further. But it doesn't change any of the policies that were in your material for tonight. So for the goal of housing supply, we're proposing several new policies. Um, these policies, these first three, uh, X1 is primarily focusing on higher density and diversity of housing focused in the regional growth center. Uh, this is a, something that is actually required by the state and county, and so we are um, in compliance with those requirements with this policy. With X2, develop regu regulations and prioritize needs of cost burden uh, populations. This is also a requirement from the state and county to address within the conference plan. For X3, remedy historical inequities in and expand access to home ownership opportunities. This is also a policy required by state and county. Are there any questions on this set of policies? Well, I know we didn't get to it. Maybe we'll start with uh, each slide. We'll stop and see if anyone has any questions about it, and then we'll see how we're doing on time. If it looks like we're uh, not burning through it pro quite properly, we'll maybe speed up. But let's try it, see what happens. Sure. Any questions as far as these three policies? Vice Chair Bader? Um, hi. I have a question on the policy X2 um, because it kind of reads as two things, um, or maybe it's like two parts. And so the first part around collaborating with populations most disproportionately impacted by housing cost burden, um, that piece feels like it shouldn't just be limited to housing supply. Um, and so I think that that kind of collaborating, right, should exist through all of these sections. And so is there a way to call that out? Um, and then the second part, right, around in developing regulations that prioritize the needs and solutions articulated by these disproportionately impacted populations feels like, like, and then, right? Right. Um, so I don't know if it makes sense as one, but I also feel like that collaborating piece should be pulled out and applied to others. I guess that's not really a question, but. Uh, no, that is, I think that's actually a really good uh, comment, Vice Chair Bader, and, and one thing, to that I just want to highlight it, you know, for the housing element, we, we wanted housing specific. This being a, a county and state requirement, we have to address the housing specific. 
we are looking at similar policies within the other elements to address that coordination that you're kind of talking to. Um, but we do have to have it specific to housing within the housing element uh, just to address what's required of us. And I think that's a good point, and hopefully for those who are watching or who will watch this later to realize and to listen carefully that some of these are state and county requirements. These are non-negotiable. Correct. Um, there is a little bit of leeway in how you word it in, in terms of like coordination with the other elements. We'll be looking at that, but um, a lot of how it's worded is based on what we see as being required of us from the county. Okay. Any other questions on this set of policies? So the next set of new policies is under the housing affordability goal, and that's to realize affordable ownership and rental opportunities throughout the city for households of all economic segments of the community. So for this, for this goal, the first three policies is the first is going to be the prioritization of 50% AMI or lower. Second is to address emergency housing, emergency shelters, and um, transitional shelters as what's now required of us, House Bill 1220. And the la third policy is the amendment of regulations to present, that present barriers to equitable housing. And that's actually a county requirement to address as a policy. Any questions on this particular slide? I do have one, and this actually comes from comments that were delivered uh, late today. The lower than 50% AMI, where does that come from? Where does that number come from? So this is actually going back to my previous slide on uh, targets. So this is being a requirement from King County to have addressed in our comprehensive plan. We have a majority of target of that target units uh, at 50% or lower. And so by prioritizing it, we are showing that as a priority. And that actually being acquired policy on showing how you're prioritizing the majority of these, uh, the targeted unit. And is, the, is, I know it's all legalistic, the word prioritize, what, how does the city define that? We again, have, some, some of this is a more market forces, correct? A lot of it is market forces, and so that's the thing with targets is we can set the policies and a lot of the foundational um, regulations around how best to encourage or achieve these housing targets, but the market's really going to be driving what actually is so for this particular policy, this is actually uh, complying with the requirement of how best we're achieving or showing that we're achieving those targets as a policy within the conference plan. Commissioner Asamoana. One question I have on um, um, policy number X4, what's the difference between X4 and policy E4, and more so with X4 says prioritize 50% or less, and E4 says 30% or below AMI. And, and I can read it if you can. Yeah, so it says, work with local, regional, and national resources to increase public and private dollars available on a local and regional level for affordable special needs housing, especially housing affordable to households at or below 30% AMI. That, uh, that amendment is actually, or so the amendment for E4 is actually a clarification of what how King County defines very low income, which is the 30% or lower income. Okay. okay, and then X4 is the prioritization. For the city. Of, okay. Correct. The next two policies, um, X7 is re reduction of barriers to ownership of 80% AMI or lower. Uh, X8 is the mitigation of uh, displacement from large-scale investment, market pressure, and land use policy. And both of these are required by state and county to incorporate as part of our policies within the conference. Vice Chair Bader. Yeah, sorry, I should have asked this before. Um, when we are talking about the percentages, is that saying that these are housing units that would be like income 
pendant or there'd be like an income requirement to purchase these or is it just something that somebody says if you're you can afford right if you make this much right. it is the latter so it's the affordability of the housing so they're not like income restricted so in theory someone with a higher income who could purchase that could purchase that house or that property Oftentimes, yes. So oftentimes, um, you have to be income restricted to be yeah. purchasing one of those okay. properties. You good? Okay. The next set of goal housing affordability goal. Ensure conference plan goals policies are accompanied by effective implementing regulations, programs, and funding. So this is on results and accountability uh, for new policies. So we are introducing a five-year evaluation of regulations, which is now a state requirement. The X10 five-year update of housing strategy work plan, this is something that actually is already adopted within the housing strategy work plan. It's just now being incorporated to the comprehensive plan. X11 is identify gaps in partnerships and resources, uh, which is also a requirement from the state and county to incorporate in our policies. And then the X-12 annual housing report card, that's actually something that's already adopted by the city. So Commissioner has some letter. Yeah, just a question on that five-year refresh. Is it um, agile enough for, I know you, it takes time to actually realize if a plan is working, but with the annual report card, is it agile enough where, let's say year two or year three, you see something isn't working that something could be tweaked and through, of course, um, uh, meetings and legislation and whatnot. Yes, absolutely. With any of our plans, we can always, if we see something wrong that we need to update, we'll absolutely update it before that five-year requirement is up. But this is just saying we are required to require at least okay. every five years. Oh, thank you. Mr. Bader? Yeah, um, sorry, a lot, lots of questions. Um, a, question on like where the monitoring fits in and what we're monitoring so are we just monitoring like progress towards some of these like numerical targets or are we monitoring progress towards the things like reducing right um impact on uh, marginalized populations um are we monitoring like some of those like more um kind of qualitative policies? it's it's all of the above so some of this with the monitoring is you know we have the monitoring with the housing report card it doesn't incorporate all what's now required of us at the state, so that's something that we'll need to update uh, following the conference plan. Please proceed. Okay. So now we're moving to the amended housing policies that are proposed. So with housing supply, uh, these first three policies, maintain adequate land supply to meet needs of the city, uh, this is a city requirement, but it, or a city policy, but it is kind of addressing some of what's required from the King County planning policies. A2, allow and promote variety of housing. That is a state county requirement. And then the adoption uh, regulations to maintain neighborhood character. That's uh, the amendments that are being proposed is really just clarifying uh, what the language uh, should be saying. And some of that is trying to bring some of our policies to what we are wanting out of the conference plan rather than what's in our functional plans or implementation. Vice Chair Bader. I took notes. This is what happens when I like have my notes in front of me. Um, on B1, just a question, the like as identified by King County, countywide planning policies, in the final draft, will those be linked to this? So like a layperson knows what that means? Yes, yeah, so in, in the, next draft of the housing element you'll see what those policies are it's primarily addressing the uh, uh, ami targets that were on the previous slide yeah. okay for these next three policies a4 require attributes that contribute to the public realm um, this is consistent with the land use code language uh, what was updated in title 18 a5 allow flexibility and standards uh, this is 
the change is primarily just clarifying, making it more actionable, um, something that we also were trying to achieve with Comfort's plan update. And then A6, higher density housing near commercial centers. This was removed because it's actually repetitive of a few other policies that were here proposed for the element. That one seems pretty self-explanatory. I think you can. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yeah, no. Okay, we can move on. So for this first set of policies, um, these are actually addressed in the land use element. So we'll be, we remove this policy primarily because it is repetitive of what's in the land use element. For A10, this is diversity and needs. This is repetitive of uh, the other policies, A2 and A5. And then for A11, this, uh, the language on ADUs and variety of density is clarified, makes it a little more actual. Any questions on this set? Okay. Okay, for the next policy, B3, this one is support development and preservation near transit. This is actually one of the state and county requirements, so it's amended of an existing policy. Uh, B2, strategies to address affordability and special needs. This one was clarified to be a little more actionable. And then goal C, this is actually repetitive policy, so we're proposing to actually remove this goal and incorporate its set of policies as part of the housing affordability goal and section. Any questions on this set? Commissioner Samuela? So just clarifying, so are you saying like section C or, or like policy C you're, you're removing? <laughs> The whole section so we it's it's primarily just the goal not the policies oh, under okay. the goal okay. so it was previously goal C in the existing comprehensive plan and housing okay. element we're proposing to remove that goal and incorporate all the C policies into the housing affordability section okay Thank you. it just seemed repetitive of what we already had so we figured we consolidate the sections Any other questions? Okay. Then next policy, C1, this one's uh, avoiding dispro disproportional impacts when making land use changes. This is a state county requirement city to incorporate as a policy. C2, offer incentives for development and preservation, another requirement of the state and county. And then C6, prioritize affordable housing on surplus land. This one uh, was amended to be clarified as more actionable. Commissioner Asimoda. Yeah, just a question on C1. I know it's a state and county requirement. Um, do they define what disproportional impacts are? There, there's no vagueness on it. Or are we able to massage the language? They provide some definitions on what that means, but okay. the city will be working through our own definitions on this for the conference. Okay, good. That would be attached to it disproportionately. Okay. Yeah, we can we can provide that. Okay. And will it be in this document or for us to look at or It would be in the conference plan document and then used further uh, within our implementation and functional plan. Okay. Thank you. And if there's other terms that you see that we can help identify or at least call out the uh, at least provide clarity within the comfort plan. Please let us know that as well. Well, I, I, any other questions? I, I've got a couple on these two slides, or this one slide. Um, so I believe it's a King County policy. I know you attached uh, King County's policies here. It says avoid disproportional changes. Um, I think it's H20, expanding housing and neighborhoods in the King County policies. Um, mitigate displacement risk consideration given the preservation I guess as well as cultural communities as well as investments in low very very low I guess is that one I'm trying to figure out is that is the idea to not I guess is the idea against gentrification 
when they say displacement or disproportional impact? It's not necessarily gentrification that they're addressing, though it's one of the uh, things that get addressed. Um, it's, it's primarily just taking into account the existing residents or tenants of, uh, of the land that's going to be developed and making sure that you are considering displacement and with the high cost of land going up, we want to make sure that we're not completely displacing a lot of the existing tenants. Right. And so and, and, how best to address that in the policies. Right, and I guess that's where some of the language is up. I mean, it's open to interpretation. You have a void. So, again, I, what one person considers a void. I'm thinking of, like, Old Town, right? A bunch of older single-family residential houses. Is the idea that, again, when you say a void, is that just, obviously that's just city land. I'm not talking about private residential houses who can sell to whoever they want. Yes and no. So um, it's not necessarily city land that we're looking at or, you know, city property that we're looking at. It's also just the development of the neighborhood. And so if, um, when talking about neighborhood characteristics, if you are wanting to main, um, maintain certain characteristics within each neighborhood that you want to consider at least the income, different income levels, particularly with the targets that we need to maintain now uh, within the comprehensive plan. I guess so, in my mind, I'm thinking of like Clyde Hill. So is the idea to make sure that something like Clyde Hill never happens here? Not necessarily. Um, it's primarily just being conscious of the existing resident tenants. And so making sure that they still have a home and we're not, people aren't feeling like they're getting pushed out. I'm sure you can talk to some people in Clyde Hill who feel like they're getting pushed out. But, you know, for those who are staying without the exception of uh, their uh, property tax, they're also seeing their land values shoot through the roof. Yeah. Um, and then I'm just going to mention this quickly because we got a another uh, some comments about incentives. We're not taking any incentive, incentives away. There was a comment about FAR, uh, the floor area ratio, um, waiving impact fees. We already do those things. Those aren't going away. Correct. Right. I just wanted to make sure that person, if they are watching, knows that. Those, those incentives are still there for the developer. Right, and, and identification of those specific tools which we need to offer as part of incentives or incentivizing a lot of the housing development that we want. Um, a lot of that gets addressed in the housing strategy work plan, so that's kind of that different level of comprehensive plan versus the functional plans. And then uh, since we're on it, uh, prioritize, there's that word again. You want to explain how the city views prioritize when it's looking at uh, policy C6? That one is... In an attempt to make it a little more actionable, because the previous language uh, was consider giving priority, and changing it to priority actually makes it as that it identifies actually priority for the city, which it is. And so, being able to change that language helps us uh, emphasize how important it is for the city. So, is there any discussion on keeping the existing language versus what's being proposed? I'm just thinking of like Talos and Issaquah Highlands, right? That was surplus land at one time. Is the idea that when you say, when the city says prior to prioritize affordable housing, are we talking about a percentage of Issaquah Highlands? Are we talking about the whole thing should have been affordable housing up on that hill? It's primarily just showing that affordable housing is a priority, not necessarily that we're designating in each of the neighborhoods a certain percentage of affordable housing. I'm satisfied. Anybody else? There we go. Commissioner has more to. Um, I know it's it's says actionable prioritize, but how, how would you how, how would you implement it or measure it? That would be a discussion with the update with the housing strategy work plan. Um, yeah. With imp implementation, and I know it's very hard to stay out of a lot of the actions, and that's really kind of the level we're trying to keep it at. Primarily, to also satisfy some of the. Uh, requirements from the county and state when it comes to this even though this is actual this is actually a policy that is required of us from the King from King mm -hmm. County and the state um, we just amended it because it was already existing policy okay I, th I think the key thing is that it's uh, the land is city land and then when somebody wants to develop on it right yes how would they 
have a discussion on prioritizing affordable, it, would it just be a discussion or would there be a have 20% or 10%? With NEA surplus land, you would evaluate it for what kind of development the city wants to do it. That's something that um, yeah. we're currently going through right now is a update to our evaluation of a lot of our surplus land to give a recommendation of what to do with it. Um, so yes, it would be a discussion of what we should do with that surplus plan to benefit city goals, uh, or at least what we're trying to achieve for the city vision of uh, for our facilities as well as for the community. And I guess it may be dependent on how much affordable housing you have at the time as well. Yes, so it's it's kind of always a moving target in terms of like how you're best achieving your own targets. Yeah, so and I think where I'm getting at is that, I mean, I get there right now, but provide more definition to it to say that we may not, this may have to go beyond this, this commission, but um, where we have definition where it says, if there's only this much affordable housing at this date and more needs to be added, then we need to add 10% or 20% in that surplus land. Yes. So it gives more definition and guidance for the people adjudicating the use of that land. Yeah, and, and a lot of this provide you know, it gives us guidance in terms right. of like when we're having those discussions with okay. each individual surplus property for the city. Because um, we don't want to give specific percentages when it might not make sense to do it with certain properties, mm -hmm. whether it's the size of the property or even the timing in terms of like how much we've been able to achieve of affordable housing within the city at the time of when the surplus property, we wanted to develop a, a surplus property at some point. Yeah. Right, because I think, it, not to butt in, but if, get me wrong, I know the city's trying to move away from development agreements, but what would happen is that would be worked out through attorneys with the city, and it's at the city council administrative mm -hmm. level. It's not a board and commission. Like you said, we're just trying to give, there might be a public hearing, but ultimately that's, that's at that higher level with attorneys. And yes and no. So, out. you know, if we have a surplus property that we're wanting to develop and we're wanting uh, it's significant enough for the community. We would probably get community feedback on how what we want to achieve with the property, whether it's uh, to sell it as a surplus property or provide it to as an amenity for community groups. Like there's there's ultimately going to be some type of community discussion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we don't want to restrict it, make it too restrictive, but we also don't want to make it loose as well correct I think we're all saying it's always kind of a balancing act with the yeah. comprehensive plan policies of just providing enough guidance so that we know how to take action exactly thank you I think you're good okay For the next goal special needs housing is chief housing opportunities for residents with disabilities or other housing special needs. And this one currently has one proposed policy to encourage accessible housing for those with disabilities. Um, the proposed amendment is primarily just clarifying what we're actually wanting to achieve with the policy. Is there a reason you guys left that word encouraged? Looks like you've stripped it from pretty much every other. Uh, it, part of it is also uh, addressing. A lot of it is actually addressed within the human services element and the human okay. services strategic plan. And so, um, and some of it is also addressed within the uh, ADA transition plan. And so it's primarily just uh, a, a recognizing that coordination with those other functional plans and the other element. The next goal, regional resources, cooperate with other jurisdictions to address the region's housing needs. And so for these proposed amendments for these policies, E1, support legislation promoting, promoting housing goals and policies. This one was simplified. E3, cooperate with others to assess local region and regional needs. And this one was also clarified to get to the intent of what we were trying to achieve. Then E4, work with local, regional, and national resources for 30%. Uh, and my households. And this is actually a state and county requirement. This is the one that uh, Commissioner Esmoyde had brought up earlier. Are there any questions on these? Okay. 
The next one, results and accountability. This is amended policy. Um, ensure regulations exist to implement goals and policies. This is actually a policy that was turned into a goal to address the new section of policies um, that are introduced with the proposal. Any questions on this one? Before I get into the next steps, is there any other goals and policies that commissioners like me to revisit? Vice Chair Bader. Yeah, it's not related to any of the ones that you like covered, so I hold it or is it is it the overall the housing element? It's related to one of the it's kind of like a general it's related to one of the policies. I don't remember if it was the county or the the county. Um that I just didn't see reflected in the policies, and I don't know if I should say that now or if there's. Go ahead and ask the there. question now. And so then... it's um, policy, the county policy H18, um, which gets to expanded housing and neighborhood choice for all residents. Um, and I know that there's like the cottage housing and micro units and all of that that I think get start to get to that, but I think there's an issue that like aff affordability more generally right like outside of just affordability as a percentage of like ami but like how do we is there like an opportunity to have like policies that also like for like fam like we couldn't move to issaquah now right and we you know fortunate enough not to fall within those ami categories but there's no way we could afford our house today that we bought three years ago um and so is there some way in the policies to just kind of promote like overall affordability um, because I think it gets a little bit to this like all residents that like anyone who wants to come to Issaquah should be able to like find the house that they want right mm -hmm. and this shouldn't be an exclusive community um, and we're doing a lot of work which is wonderful right to bring in those at lower income tiers but I also think and it might be that missing middle I'm not sure how we define that but um, it feels like it's like catering right market rate is catering to the very high income right now and then we have a lot of effort going on right at the very low tiers and then there's this entire middle group that I don't see represented um, in the housing policy and I don't know if that's appropriate and I mean, that's how it should be or if there's a way to somehow address that you know we can take a look at that a little bit closely to see if we can add a little more language to, to answer your question um, I know there's a balance of uh, keeping at the high level with the conference plan, yeah. which there, there's, I think, two policies right now that kind of address middle housing. Um, but to the language that's in H18 mm -hmm. of the King County policies, it gets more into the strategy. But I, I think you're right that we could potentially have a, a few more policies that kind of address this. Let me ask you this real quickly, and then Commissioner Asmwana. Um, so you burned through all the slides. <laughs> Commissioners, yeah, this is your time. <laughs> And uh, I will ask something right after Commissioner Moeta. Um, and to the point that Commissioner Better talked about the, the that missing middle, I see that for the AMI you have up to 120 percent AMI, but of course sometimes that middle class may be a little bit above that as well. So that that's I think a concern for a certain amount of people in this community that if you look at the AMI and the cost of housing in Issaquah at AMI, um, depending on which location in Issaquah, they may not be able to afford the current um, um, inventory of houses right now, let alone you get a little bit above that AMI level. So um, looking forward, that AMI I think is, is a good start but to um, Commissioner Vader's point is to also look at um, not only addressing, of course, the higher earners and the lower earners, but that 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 missing middle as well. Yes. More of a statement. Yeah. So Maybe. missing middle, you know, primarily missing middle just provides a wider spectrum of housing types within the city. It doesn't necessarily solve or address a lot of the affordable housing needs of the city. It primarily just provides more options. Exactly. And it helps build in more of the housing supply to address some of the affordability. Yeah. I never unmuted myself, prepared for to share more, <laughs> apparently. Because um, I'm thinking of things like utilities, right? Like cost of utilities, um, things that impact home ownership outside of just the cost of purchasing a home um, that might be within the realm, and probably not the comprehensive plan. I don't know. Um, things like 
you know, transparency with like, how are we like using city funds for infrastructure and then asking for like property tax levies, like that sort of stuff that gets to just the cost of owning a home, right? Outside of the cost of a home. Does that make sense? I think so. Are you looking for a specific policy in terms of how we're addressing that or yeah, strategies? Yeah, I, I just don't know it? if that, like, does that exist somewhere? Because it, it's more about, like, affordability of home ownership than, like, so it's like once you own the home, right, how do you afford to stay in the home, especially with, like, how much everything is going up right now? Um, and is there a way that, like, we can plan for that um, for, so that we're not being forced out of homes because of these, like, major increases in property tax, for example. You know, I'll I'll meet with my team to kind of discuss that. I don't know if many of you And I, I recognize the comprehensive plan might not, is possibly not the place for that. Right, right. But. right. Good evening, commissioners. Um, great conversation and great topic. I think um, from a policy standpoint, you guys could come up with a new policy. So this is what we have. But if this is missing, to work with existing residents to be able to keep their affordability, you know, um, and that could be evaluation of city's policies uh, of, you know, m we don't control some of those things that, you know, uh, the market will dictate, but, but how do we invest in existing infrastructure and others to keep the cost low, to keep the residents that have enjoyed, you know, or, or open up for it. So I think some of the other the disparate um, you know, any kind of assessment of the impact of any city's policies. They could be financial, they could be investment of infrastructure. You know, where is the city's capital projects going uh, Going and assisting with um, the neighborhoods that have not historically been invested in? Those kind of things could be, you know, added as new policies if, if based on your discussion, there's consensus that that's missing. From the comp plan. So this, the, I think the list that you have is what the state required and then what um, we had to change just to make it more clear. But if there's other things you'd like to uh, perhaps add that could go into that category. That's really helpful. That was my answer to the like what's needed for Issaquah um, question. Yeah. So that's... What's unique about our city here yeah. that um, is still meeting the the state and the county goals and all that kind of stuff. I, th I think listening to your conversation about King County countywide planning policies and targets, you know, yeah. I think we've kind of talked about it, but it is confusing and it gets, it, those are just to plan for and accommodate those numbers. It's not you're going to get that, you right. know, you may get more than that. The yeah. market will drive some of those things, but we have to be ready to serve that many units in those categories. So the, the new countywide planning policies that haven't been adopted is my understanding have this affordability level. So our target numbers of 3,500 were then split into zero to 30%, 50% and you know, in that spectrum. So as we do the comprehensive plan, we have to plan for and accommodate. So we can't have rules and regulations or policies that prohibit the, that type of uh, mix mm -hmm. to go in. Um, but it doesn't mean Issaquah is going to get that many, you know, a lot of factors will go into whether, you know, there is subsidies, there's market-driven incentives, and but the regulations have to have that lens of, you know, is there added density bonus, for instance, for lower AMI versus higher AMI? So those kind of things will be, will be evaluated as we get into the, the application of these goals and or the implementation. Yeah, but the... The numbers really come from a regional level. The, you know, the forecast that happens for this three-county region is X amount. Then each of these cities get their allocation that they have to plan for and accommodate. So ours was 3,500. And then now it's finally, uh, you know, one step further to say how many of those percentages and how that 3,500 gets split into. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but I think uh, lot, there's always confusion about what are these targets. They're just targets for the city to plan for and accommodate those numbers uh, so that or we have sewer capacity, water capacity, schools, other things to serve that kind of growth in those segments. Yeah. Commissioner Smwada. 
Now, the other question with the targets that were provided by the state and county, 3,500 now, does that number, is that, does that number fit Issaquah from the sense of, hey, why isn't it 3,510? Or are we just, are we accepted the 3,500? Yeah, the projections work at the region level. You know, you can't get that fine-grained correct mm -hmm. numbers at a city boundary level because a lot of, you know, things can impact the affordability being one of them, but also the cost of development, the, the other environmental factors and how much developable land we have. But we, we can't zone, you know, one house per five acres kind of thing and then not accommodate a 3,500. Uh, people, so our capacity has to be at least thirty five hundred. Is okay. sort of the the yes. way it plays out. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Minnie or Stephen on this particular topic? I have a couple. Um, so I guess what I was going to say, and locking it out now, as far as you said, the capacity, as far as the homes. I guess, like you said, it's it's market rate. That's the thing I think people are, are not really realizing. It's not that the city can, and I guess for me, I, what I'm trying to understand is when you say you, you can't limit or you can't exclude, does that mean you just allow anything to be built anywhere as long as they have 30% under AMI as a part of their building? Um, there's like H policy A2. Uh, allow and promote a variety of housing types and lot sizes, zones that allow residential development, including but not limited to accessory dwelling units, duplexes. So in that policy, are we saying you could build a mini mansion uh, in the middle? And we, I know we had like a, a zoning thing a couple years ago where somebody wanted to build a mansion. They couldn't. Yeah, I, I think it's the opposite. It's the, the House opposite. Bill 1110 is really getting at missing middle. Uh, and, you know, like uh, Stephen said, we're still trying to figure there's a lot that happened at legislature in right. the last session, and, and it, it's pretty complex. Department of Commerce is going to give us a guidance. They're still working on some of these things, so we don't have all the answers to that yet, uh, but those will come. Uh, but I think this policy is really saying allow and promote these um, you know, missing middle types. Okay, and then I do, I, now it's going back to me. So you mentioned regional. Stephen mentioned that these numbers, these AMI, this is all pretty new. And I'm not trying to get staff into trouble. I know you guys have always worked with other jurisdictions and cities, but if this is all new, this is, I mean, how much of this is, how much are they trying to dictate the city of Issaquah to do something at regional level, King County, that was always our purview. I guess you can answer yeah, that. Yeah, they looked at the, the housing need in the region, and they determined that our region's going to grow this much, but there is a significant need for people in these income brackets that have no place to live. They're trying to address homelessness. They're trying to look at where are these people going to be housed. And so, so that, let me ask you this. Yeah. How much of Issaquah's purview the last year has gone from we had this type of purview down to here now because of these introduced. We've always had the framework of planning in the state is you've got the Growth Management Act, right. you know, that establishes the framework, open, promote open spaces and, you know, have affordable housing. That's one of the goals uh, all 1990. That's always been the charter. Now the King County countywide planning policies have always been in place. Our comprehensive plans have to be in compliance with those countywide planning policies. That's how planning is set up in the state. And the way the countywide planning policies go through a growth management policy, a GMPC, that is made, you know, gets input from the cities. They debate and discuss and pass that on to King County Council to adopt. And, and then there's also an affordable housing committee at the, you know, that is made up of different cities and, and others. So there was a lot of public process that went into uh, what is this regional need, where, how do we plan for and accommodate for this, and they came up with this table that it was shown of Issaquah's split. Each city got their numbers split into that. So that ta new table 
that talks about targets based on affordability is the new piece in the countywide planning policies. But countywide planning policies have always been there. They just established this new table for affordability levels based on all the discussion in the region and where we are as a region and how do we accommodate this need for this segment of our population that is going to have this need for, they can't afford, you know, their affordability is X amount and everyone takes this share. That's sort of the, the discussion that happened at the regional level where we now have to plan for and, you know, and accommodate. It doesn't say we are going to get it, uh, but each of our policies cannot prohibit some of those things. So if we have incentives in our policies, how where we put infrastructure, waiver of fees for affordable housing, you know, whatever those uh, things at a policy level that the city can do is infrastructure, how, how much does it cost, and those kind of things, and how do we zone land, and what kind of development regulations, what incentives we can give. But, the, the, you know, some of that stuff will will play out the way it will in, in the real world. Right, and I know if I can only speak for myself, I mean, I think there may be the reason you're not seeing a lot of pushback I think a lot of us probably like the goals and policies that as it was setting, you know, some of the new things you guys are introducing. Um, I'll be honest, the King County ones I'm a little bit more leery of, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. And I just, that was going to be one of my questions for uh, Stephen, was, you know, the King County, I mean, there's a particular one that struck me was H22, adopt and implement policies that protect housing stability for rental house. That's awfully close to rent control, wrong? Which would be some, introducing something quite new to is it? Yeah, I don't, I'm not familiar with the rent control, that, that, the link that you're making between Right, that it's and just, the, yeah. I just, is, does that We can look into that policy and see what odd, that means. Yeah. Struck me as kind of odd. Yeah, we can look further into that policy. Yeah, um, yeah but at the end of the day, uh, you know, Puget Sound Regional Council has to certify the city's comprehensive plan. And one of their criteria is, is it consistent with the countywide planning policies? So for right. the city to apply for grants, to do all of these, we have, you know, and again, that umbrella of the framework, they, the certification process from PSRC is tied to these countywide planning. So we, our comprehensive plan cannot be completely inconsistent with the countywide. If there's discretion about what this means or whatever, we can debate that and discuss that. But we cannot have completely ignore uh, the countywide planning. Right, right. Yeah. It's just the language. Yeah, yeah, and again, yeah. It's yeah. The and language. we're still learning of and, what that really means. And again, I'm just trying to figure out how closely we stick next to King County because, again, I mean, for all of those who don't follow King County, the King County Council tips one way very directly, mm -hmm. which is fine. It's what the voters want. But I'm just saying, is it good for Issaquah? And you're saying you can't get certified, you can't get grants unless follow their prescription. Correct. But I think there's a public process to be involved in that countywide planning policies. It isn't just King County. There are cities and, you know, there's a structure for when those are discussed in debate. Ultimately, King County adopts them. Seventy percent of the cities have to ratify the countywide planning policies for them to become effective. So, so there's a ratification process even after King County Council makes it. Thank you for that. Yep. Yep. Appreciate that. Vice Chair Bader. Yeah, I'm going to, I have a little comment box actually on that H22 and H23. Because um, I think pathways to housing stability is a good thing, right? We don't want to get to a place where rents are so out of control that people, you know, are one page, like one lost paycheck away, right, from losing their home. We don't want that. And so I read that more as like tenant rights. Um, and similarly, like the housing, healthy and safe homes, which is the, 23 those are things that I also didn't see like in the housing like how do we ensure that like our existing housing stock is of high quality right that it's healthy for people um, and that like landlords right are expected to maintain homes that potentially renters are living in especially like the old older housing stock that we have here um, and I again I don't I'm showing like my just lack of knowledge of how local government works I think like I'm assuming it's not the comp plan but like where, where do those things exist? Because they're they're obviously directly related to housing, um, but it's less about like growth management and again more about like management of existing 
stock, right? Um, so I think a lot of the strategy you're speaking to from the, the King County planning policies is more of the implementation side of it okay. also. It is trying to keep to the higher level that provides guidance, but it's really going to be in the housing strategy work plan or okay. any um, housing programs that the city puts in place. Okay, that's, that's yeah, that's perfect. But like Minnie said, we'll we'll take another look at these policies to see if there's anything that we can introduce in the conference plan that kind of addresses some of that concern. Commissioner Smollett. And something like that, um, what um, Commissioner uh, Bader just talked about, um, that would be something that we'd look at at a later date as well. Yes, this okay. is not going to be the only night we'll be talking okay. about these policies. Okay. We'll be coming back. And so, uh, yes, we'll be, we'll be coming back to another meeting to introduce um, more potential policies or revisions to these, some of these based on your comments tonight and at, at uh, upcoming meetings. Thank you. I know momentarily we're going to get to next steps and pretty much wrap this up. So just want to make sure our commissioners are asked what they wanted to ask. I mean, again, for me, a lot of this sounds very good. So I think that's one of the reasons I'm comfortable with it. There's a couple sticking points, which for me I brought up, but I know I'll hear more from staff. Okay. So I can go to the next. Oh, there's <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Um. So I'll, I'll promise I will stop after this. Just a clarifying question on like the inclusion of the different housing types in like it reads as like all residential zones. Um, when I read that, I also like am making an assumption that like our land use code right will restrict some of what is allowed. Right, that my neighbor couldn't sell his property and then build like a 50 unit micro right like apartment complex on the lot next to my house because that's not permitted right by the land use code like they're yes so that's kind of how I'm rationalizing the like allowance of these different types in multiple zones that it'll all be kind of regulated by right the policy code. that we're proposing for the conference plan is primarily just recognizing that requirement from House Bill 1110 the next step in this process is then to now propose development code updates to address it specifically any changes of the zones to allow a lot of these middle housing types that we're addressing. Yeah. Open it up. I am done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Okay, before we move away from policies, actually I have a question about a policy that wasn't edited. Or edited. Yes. Um, it's policy A7. Yes. Um, where practices provide equal access for people of recognized protected classes. Can we broaden that policy um, I mean it's a nice long list but what if it and we find out it's not comprehensive whenever you do lists like this it's always nice to be including but not limited to and you know so that if there is needs to be an addition it can easily be added or that class is easily included if we're not limiting to just that list the very second one on the what number page? was that Commissioner Kennedy? can you Pardon repeat me? the number yeah um it's h policy a7 housing supply okay ensure that the city's programs regulations and land use practices provide equal access for people of recognized protected classes there's, then there's a parenthetical with a list of classes which is nice mm -hmm. and long probably comprehensive but as lists go they can become outdated. Um, can we broaden it um, to say, you know, somehow to say recognized for all people, including but lot, you know, without limitation, recognized classes? Yes. Yeah, we can take a look at that. Thank you for that. I just had one quick thing about the. The emergency shelters and emergency housing, permanent supportive housing, again, is that, so that to me would seem like the city is required to build, or is again, that's just we're making allowances for them, we're providing the zoning for those things to go into? Correct. It's, it's the requirement is we must allow it. It's not requiring us to construct it. But we do have human services goals 
around providing some of those services and, and opportunities. Yeah, I was involved in one of those uh, houses with our company, uh, one in Bothell, and then we took the trip to the one in Kirkland. I mean, those are great. Um, so again, I'm, I guess that was more for clarification. So. All right, Stephen, <laughs> I think that's about it. Okay. <laughs> Pardon so go, going back to the questions, well, I guess I'll go back to next steps. So right now we're going to be revising some of these goals and policies based on the feedback we received. Um, also looking at some of the public comment of what we received and trying to address some of that. We're going to be coming back with another draft. Um, and then the goal is to aim for state review of the draft of the entire plan and then in the first quarter early next year, put together all the final review of the elements and then work towards a public hearing and adoption process in middle of next year. Your slides disappeared. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. That's okay. I pressed share, but it didn't. Thank you for that. So going back to the, the questions, I think a lot of your comments and questions tonight went at the first question of do the draft goals policies accurately reflect the state and county policies. Getting back to the second question, I know uh, Vice Chair Bader has provided some of the feedback on are there is the cost specific issues that we need to be addressing the goals and policies. Is there anything additional to um, in the housing elements, maybe something that you didn't see in the goals and policies that we need to take a look at? Um, and then is there, you know, coming back to you, this is not going to be the first meeting we'll be talking about this. Is there any specific information that would be helpful for you to better understand some of these goals and policies or at least how best to approach them or, or how we're not approaching them? Um, I'll kick it off as far as number two. So is it cost specific? We spent a lot of time uh, in our land use code figuring out different type of boundaries for streams and rivers and things like that. And we also spent a lot of time on neighborhoods particularly like old town and things like that so how would those incentives work i mean i guess i guess what we put in the land use code would trump any type of comprehensive policy so if the setback from a protected wet area is what it is you regardless if you're trying to build 30 percent lower ami you wouldn't be able to encroach on that any more or less than what we've already allowed I think I'm interpreting your question. Right? Is, <laughs> That's yes, a bit so the, develop, the development regulations, you, okay. you need to be comp in compliance with those standards, but there's always kind of a negotiation process with, with some developments and that you're looking at getting in affordable housing in certain areas, but that is kind of embedded in some of those development regulations as well. Okay. Same thing with like the Old Town Code, Old Town Standards. Yeah, if I'm understanding your question, you're saying <laughs> can there be incentives for, you know, under the development regulations. So for critical areas, no. Generally, those are based on science, and, you know, it doesn't matter which kind of house or whatever. But things like extra height, more, less parking, you know, those kind of development regulations could, could be lower to incentivize some of these uh, additional, you know, things that are needed. As, as, if that's what, you know, will, will make them more favorable. Uh, to be built under that provision. So as we look at development regulations, if there are incentives and the policies are to have this for this AMI or that AMI, I think there's that cross-check that needs to occur with your development regulations. Of, is it meeting the policy that we have to do this? Are these incentives okay for this type or that type? Right, and I appreciate you both interpreting my lingo. I'm not as good at the city lingo bingo as you guys are, but uh, yeah, that's kind of what it's asking. Yeah. So we put in all these structures, these these critical areas, things like that. And, and again, the way I'm reading some of this is you prioritize or you must allow or you must make way for this type of housing or this type of AMI. Okay, how is that? I imagine that there's going to be a point where that's in conflict with a certain area. What's... What trumps? Yeah, it doesn't mean all your development regulations don't have to comply. It just means is there some that can be used as an incentive to promote whatever whatever our language ends up being um, for that type of a, you know 
development that is required for us to plan for. I understood you two perfectly. <laughs> Any other additional comments? Uh, we'll just take this one, two, and three. I know we've already spent a lot of time on one, but to Stephen's point, any comments as far as is a quasi specific issue? All right. Yeah, you know the last thing I'll say, like we said before, is the 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 house bills and the state, you know, the the, the amount of stuff that came from state legislature towards us is going to take some time. To, there are a lot of nuances for those bills, and so we're waiting for some guidance from Department of Commerce that's going to come our way. There's going to be a lot of discussion and debate about what that means. Is that really what it means? So we will, you know, come up with a way to unpack all of those for, for you all. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, Issaquah is way ahead of some of our cities. Uh, the amount of townhomes and other missing middle that, that Issaquah has compared to a proportionate share of their residential stock is ahead of all of our neighboring cities. I mean, 50% of our residential zone land allows multifamily already, which is contrary to some of the other cities that have, you know, 70 to 80% single family zoning. So, you know, we, I mean, Issaquah has done uh, good work in that uh, area of having missing middle already you know it's not just going to come through the state's work at this point we we already have uh, a lot of our housing stock but we have work to do for diversity of housing choices and and you know the that's the, the housing action plan information that we've previously shared which was a community-led effort of you know here are the nine strategies um, but again I think this is comprehensive planning is really the 20 year plan and planning for and all that so it you can go back and forth between those two but but this is a little bit at a, at a higher level I know for me and I can only speak for me but I, sometimes when I think of these things and I'm, I'm trying to think of how it goes so I'm thinking of old town I'm trying to think you know as far as how the developer would feel and then I'm trying to have to think how the neighbor would feel how you know they've got this nice quaint two bedroom house and then all of a sudden a a fourplex goes right up next to him. And at the same time, I'm trying to also feel like, you know, the developer and him being able to work w within reason. And then, like I said, I go back to, like, Clyde Hill and seeing progress there. So it's all these competing things for me. And I don't know. I don't know if it's like that for everybody else. But I think a lot of people are struggling with what is this and how to, you know, how to end and work with it. And really doing it thoughtfully. Yeah, I mean, that's for me, that's one of my biggest fears is just making sure as a quad develops. I mean, as a quad is a, a beautiful town. And again, I, I know I've said it before, I've seen cities that did not develop well. And I think, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to, like you said, 20 year plan to make sure that fate doesn't happen. Yeah, and, and, you know, really not just from the aesthetic standpoint, but also from the infrastructure, the sewer, the water, you yeah. know, all those things to serve this area. I think some of that work we're going to undertake with EIS. Um, on the technical side of what does this mean in terms of utilities and, and parking and you know all of those things we we have some unique areas of the city and and where you can't just widen the roads and no oh, tell yeah. me about it front street right now is crazy <laughs> yeah. with 18 yeah. being closed yeah. oh my god the fight every day well thank you Minnie uh, Commissioner Patterson Saved all my monologues for the end. Um, <laughs> uh, on question number two there, kind of Issaquah specific issues, uh, I was reviewing the housing report card from 2022, and it did specify that there was no development in the urban growth center of central Issaquah. Um, now, I'm kind of getting the sense that the comprehensive plan is very high level. However, given that that is such a focus, is that worth considering for the comprehensive plan being the central Isquah or urban growth area? Yeah, so in, I'm trying to remember which exact policy it is. We have a policy specifically on 
prioritizing the investments to go into the regional growth center for such as well. So that is something that before it was encouraged. Um, we're trying to make it a little more actionable now with the, the amendment that we were proposing for that policy. So kind of getting to your point of, yes, we want to realize it, but it's more than just the comprehensive plan. So we want to identify as kind of a priority for the city, but we need to have further discussion with the housing strategy work plan. We need to look at the central well plan again, and then also look at any uh, updates to the development regulations in order to help us realize what we want for central well. Absolutely. Okay. Um, that's kind of a great segue into my question that kind of works on question three there, which is, is there additional information? Um, the most exciting section I saw, like I thought all the policies looked great and, and the goals I think are very ideal and, and uh, a great direction for the city to go. Um, but the most exciting thing to me was the results and accountability section, uh, because I think as a very data driven person, I think that being able to you know, show the effectiveness or show the improvements that are being made or, or how the, the effective, effectiveness of those regulations are, you know, improving the city is an important aspect of a plan, right? Like you make a plan, how is it working? <laughs> um, it might be a little lofty of an ask, but is it possible to get uh, like a combination of like metrics, like either baseline metrics that would be considered you know, five years from now, what we would measure off of? And or is there an opportunity um, to see where these things would be reflected? So for instance, like I know the comprehensive plan influences the housing report card, the housing strategy work plan. Um, you know, where could we expect to see things like the, um, the policies that we've written up in the comprehensive plan? Where would that data be reflected, you know, to look at five years from now? That's going to be, well, it's going to be in um, any version that we have to the housing strategy or the housing report card, but also that five-year report that we have to do for the state, as well as going to be looking at how well we're achieving a lot of those regulations or uh, uh, policies and goals. Commissioner Um Now, that report card, um, is that something that's going to be developed later on, or it's already... Okay. So we have the housing report card now okay. um, that you can take a look at, but okay. the, the state required five-year uh, report will be something that will be developed. Okay, the five-year, and then the, the annual one, you'll be utilizing the same template, basically. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Vice Chair Bader? Will the, like, how, what do you call it, the housing strategy something? The yeah. work plan? Yeah, work plan. Will that be, I think it was like the climate one that had like the policy and then it had the specific targets underneath it. I think it was a long time ago we looked at it and I don't. I so there's uh, the housing strategy work plan with the, the different strategies yeah. for housing. And then we also have the uh, Isquad climate action plan. Yeah, that I'm just using at, that as an example okay. of like a template because I think that that was the one that had like very specific targets under each of the policies. Yes. And so will we get to that point with the housing strategy where we have those like very specific targets under each policy? Yeah, so we'll getting more into the specific strategies of what we're trying to achieve, we'll get and go into the housing strategy work. Because well, I think that's like the additional information that would be helpful for me. Because I keep, I feel like I keep asking like, where is, where is this going to be and where mm -hmm. does this go? Um, just like big picture, right? Okay. Of like what, what are all of the documents? And even like across the elements, I know that like, we have the titles of the elements, but like what goes into each one of those elements, just so I can like do some of this like mapping in my own brain without having to like have 97 post-its on my notes that are like, where is, does this fit in the comp plan? Um, I think that would be helpful as I'm like processing this. So we did provide in the materials for the, the meeting in May, I'm trying to remember yeah. the specific date, but we did provide the overview for the housing element. Kristen did a, do a pretty good job in her memo of identifying all the different uh, plans and elements and goals and policies that are located in the city related to housing. Take a look at that and then uh, let us know how we might be able to yeah, improve on I that. Yeah, I feel like some of my questions go outside of housing okay. that are like housing like adjacent, um, okay. like the things like the affordability stuff and like cost of utilities and that's like not directly housing, but like. Like I said, my questions are always like, where, where, where is right. this? Like, does right. this fit? It's yeah. kind of the overall picture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any 
any other if, questions? If that's easy. If it's not easy, that's okay. <laughs> we'll take a look at it. All right, so that's, uh, I think we're done with number two. So how about three? Is there any additional information? We'll see. Vice Chair Bader <laughs> just did that one, but and it, I'll ask for everybody. Question three. Is there any other in additional information that would be helpful? All right. The floor is yours. Okay. That's actually all my slides. I'll stop sharing my screen. That we're done with our regular business. That's it. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Minnie. Thank you, Thomas and Jared, up here, too. We're going to start with reports. Do we have any city council updates you'd like to share? I know they met Monday night, I believe. Uh, good evening. Yeah, I can report on uh, Monday. So. Uh, the city of Issaquah won the lead um, gold uh, award for, which is the only state uh, city in the state of Washington to get achieve that award, um, and only five that are lead certified in Washington State. So that's a big achievement. A lot of credit goes to Stacy, um, our sustainability manager, uh, that took the time to apply and all that, and, and there was a celebrate. You know, so it, it's a it's a great achievement for the city all the things that the city's doing. Um, we have more work to do, and you guys as planning um, commissioners have played a big part into you know, discussing those policies and debates. Climate action plan came to you all, um, and mobility master plan. I mean, all those things got points for us to win this award, so congratulations to, to you all. Um, the other item on Monday um, night was the budget priorities. So the community survey that was done um, ha had highlighted a few things and that that were prioritized into the top things, you know, police um, stuff and then transportation. And then for us, it was uh, planning and permitting. So what we heard from the community survey was, you know, we got good um, points for customer service. We got good points for online permitting. Uh, we have some work to do on process improvements and uh, timeliness of our permit reviews, so we're working on those. Um, but we also shared with council the things that were budgeted with uh, with this year's two biennial budget. So uh, the funding that came to do the comprehensive planning uh, EIS, because the city has developed and you know with these development agreements that had separate EISs. So we're taking a you know. A big technical part of this is evaluating all the um, the environmental impact statement for the comprehensive plan. So we did get funding for that. The council also gave us funding for parking study, housing diversity options, um, and uh, and yeah, affordable housing uh, planner. We had one position uh, in the budget. Uh, however, we have uh, decided to have our economic development uh, manager. Focus on the um, on the capital side of uh, affordable housing, and Kristen and Arch are providing support for the policy objectives on affordable housing. So, really looking at the funding that the city got through for, uh, House Bill 1406, which was the state's portion of the sales tax um, that the city got, and then the House Bill 1590, which was the um, you know King Candy was going to adopt. Uh, adopted that increase in sales tax, the city of Issaquah did, uh, and that funding and how to allocate that for the affordable housing initiatives. So that's what we're doing uh, in response to the um, community survey. So we, we had a discussion with council over that. Yeah, that's Monday night's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a bit busy Monday night, but that sounds wonderful. And I did hear about the LEED certification. That's great. Yeah. yeah. That's a big thing. Big achievement for us. All right. Any other reports? Okay. Are there any other announcements? Anything for the good of the order, commissioners? Everybody enjoying their uh, dog days of summer?
All right, well, that we will adjourn tonight's meeting of the Planning Policy Commission at 7.48 p.m. Thank you.